Playing in Time and Space. The Miracle of Inspired Manifestations. By Richard Dots. Table of Contents. Chapter 1. A Daring Invitation from Richard Dots. Chapter 2. An Alternate Instant Manifestation Universe. Chapter 3. How the Universe Always Responds Instantly. Chapter 4. The Illusion of Time. Chapter 5. The Weight is Always Optional. Chapter 6. What Really Happens When You Visualize. Chapter 7. How to Overcome Negative Conditioning That Block Your Manifestations. Chapter 8. Living from Inspiration and Receiving Your Good. Chapter 9. Rules Book for Playing in Time and Space. Chapter 1. A Daring Invitation from Richard Dots. This book is a daring invitation from me to you, for us to play together at the boundaries of time and space. As we embark on this exciting journey together, I will gently but firmly invite you to examine age-old and long-held beliefs. You will decide whether you still want to continue believing in them, and if not, be led through the process of surrendering yourself to a whole new reality. Of course, none of this is for an amateur reality creator or a cynic. If you believe that the world or reality around you is as it is, and that everything is always the same old, same old, cast in stone and cold hard reality then this book may not be appropriate for you at this time. I invite you to put it down and pick it up later when your heart tells you to do so. But if your heart starts to race as you read these words, and if you always had a deep, inner knowing that reality is not what it seems to be, and that you ultimately create your own reality, then this book is an invitation for us to play. Whatever choice you make, know that it will be the perfect choice for you at this time. After taking thousands of readers through the manifestation process and sharing my own insights about being a conscious creator, I was inspired to write this next book. The one which you are currently holding in your hands. Writing these series of books have been an exhilarating adventure for me not only have I been blessed with the wonderful opportunity of sharing my insights with a whole new audience I did not even know existed, readers from around the world have been writing to me telling me about their manifestation success stories and how things have suddenly started happening for them in their lives. Things have started happening for me too, since I followed my heart to share these tips and techniques with readers all over the world. I have been led to new perspectives and new teachings, which has led me on greater and more glorious spiritual trips and adventures. I love reading and learning about this whole process of conscious reality creation because I firmly believe it is what we have been put on this planet to do. We have been blessed with creative faculties which can be directed at will, and the universe responds immediately and unfailingly to each and every one of our requests. If everyone living on the planet today truly understood how powerful this whole process is, the perceived problems of our time will be eradicated in no time. A problem ceases to become a problem once the solution is in sight, even if it has not technically been solved yet. In the same way, a problem is only a question we have not found the answer to for the time being. Why do we sometimes not find the answers to our perceived life problems? The great Albert Einstein explained it beautifully when he said, the problems of our generation cannot be solved with the same level of consciousness that created them. How many of us have read this quote, thought that it was somewhat clever and then glossed over it? Sit for a while and ponder over it for a moment. Einstein was hinting at a greater universal truth, the problems of our generation cannot be solved with the same level of consciousness that created them. What then, is consciousness? Consciousness is our mind, our inner state of being, our spiritual state. Einstein was telling us that you cannot expect answers to your questions, if you remain fixated on the questions. You need to move and gently shift your consciousness to resonate at the same level as the answer you seek. Spiritual teachers and authors often speak of levels of consciousness, as if one is higher or lower than the other. They may say, for example, that we have a higher self or a higher level of consciousness. But please understand that any connotations of height or level is only to make this whole subject easier for us to understand. There is no physical mountain or ladder we can look at. Similarly, there is no one part of us that is higher than the other. Everything just is. Can you see how pervasive the concept of space is in our society? Since we occupy physical space, we have come to associate so strongly with our physical realities, with the spaces that our bodies move around in. Even in our spiritual quest, 
we have been taught to identify with a higher self, or that heaven is a place that is physically higher than hell. Similar teachings are present in other religions such as Buddhism, in which the concept of a western pure land is weaved into its teachings. So is there really a Zen garden, or a western pure land which all of us can physically go to? Can we physically float up to heaven, or descend into hell? Even the process of ascension suggests the physical motion of rising up to something, as in the everyday usage of the word. These physical relativisms and references are useful for our initial grasping of the subject, but it will be way more exciting once you learn how to move beyond them, once you learn to see them as what they truly are, as signposts and anecdotes to help us on our way. I invite you to stay with this thought for a moment and think about all the space-related elements that have been so closely intertwined with our everyday existence. For example, we say that we possess certain things in our lives, or that we have attracted certain things into our physical reality. This means that these things are currently occupying actual physical space in our reality. What about the things which we do not yet have? Well, we consider those things to be out there, to be not yet in our physical reality to be there and not here. Just notice how we have a tendency to attach a spatial connotation to everything in our life. Not that attaching a spatial connotation is right or wrong, but I invite you to ponder for a moment on how attached we have become to our physical realities. Then in the next chapter, I will invite you to take this thought further and ponder an entirely new reality. At the beginning it may seem as if nothing is happening. It may seem as if you are sitting in your armchair, book in hand, doing these silly thought experiments. But as the famous prosperity teacher Catherine Ponder, pun not intended, used to say, when it seems like nothing is happening, that is when everything is happening. Again, notice the spatial and physical connotations that we have so conveniently attached to things. If nothing physical is happening, then nothing real must be occurring. We judge reality on the basis of whether something is physical. But is this belief resourceful? Does it serve me? Does it serve you? I can assure you that many alternative beliefs are equally plausible and even more empowering. Nothing is more entertaining to me than doing a thought experiment in my armchair, and then seeing my physical reality shift around me to accommodate my new, stretched beliefs. Think of your beliefs as a rubber band. It returns back to its original state when stretched at first, but slowly and surely as you keep stretching it, it gradually loosens. When your beliefs are loosened, you ease yourself into a new state of being, and a new state of reality. This means the creation of new results in your life. It is important to adopt a fun and playful attitude as you engage in all of this. Stretch the rubber band of your beliefs not so that you will ultimately get something, but because it is fun to do so. It is fun to see the universe respond. The more playful you get at it, the more the universe will respond and reciprocate and the easier it will be for you to spot signs and changes. The harder you are on yourself, expecting certain results and outcomes, the more counterproductive it becomes and the more difficult it is for you to enjoy the process. This is why I seldom make references to the outcome in any of the processes and techniques detailed in this book. The joy is in the playing. By stating an outcome, I am already cueing you on what to expect, and therefore restricting the infinite possibilities that you can experience for yourself. By leaving everything free and open-ended, you are inviting magic and miracles to come into your life in just the right and perfect way. The universe will deliver just what is right and perfect for you, in line with your broader intentions. There is a saying that the yogis always had a mischievous glint in their eyes, because they know that life is only playing with them, and that they, too, are playing with life. Readers of my other books will probably find this book a little unstructured. But there is a method to the madness. As mentioned above, if you are reading this book to solve a particular urgent problem or perceived need in your life, this book may be a difficult read for you. You may just pour through it and miss all the golden nuggets. If you are reading this book hoping to find that one new secret, or one missing secret, it is going to be tough on you because then you'll not be playing. You'll be straining. But all is not lost. The way is simple. If you can put aside your perceived problems and worries for the period while you're reading this book and immerse yourself completely in the nonchalant, indifferent joyful attitude of play, then you're there already. Whatever you need will be there for you when you need it. I mean this both literally and figuratively. In other words, 
When you stop focusing on the issues themselves and start loosening up, the goodness starts flowing into your life in endless streams. Notice the spatial connotations I couldn't help but use again in my previous sentence, about goodness flowing into your life from some point, somewhere out there, into your life. But for now, it is an apt example to illustrate my point. What tools do you need to play with reality and the universe? Do you need a special computer that allows you to tap into the network? Fortunately not. Do you need a password that is somehow withheld from you? Nope. You already possess everything you need. Your consciousness is all you need. Your body is all you need. Your thoughts, feelings, and emotions are all you need. You were born with all the tools to do this. Everything you need is already within you, in a structure that supports you. Now you just need to deliberately direct and use these tools in a certain way to achieve the results you so desire. How? Don't even worry about consciously picking these skills up. We'll ease right into them as you read and try the techniques suggested in the following chapters. It's all going to be happening right here, right now, in your mind. Chapter 2, An Alternate Instant Manifestation Universe Let's set the stage for our time together. Again, notice my use of the word stage and time in the last sentence? Space-time references are so deeply embedded and so central to our way of functioning in the world today that we hardly pause and think about whether they serve us. Of course, you might say, I have to be able to function in the real world. I have my jobs and responsibilities, my children and family to tend to, and all the things that need to be done. I have to go to a certain place, engage myself in certain errands and fulfill my responsibilities to various parties. Space and time is very real and persistent to me indeed. It is definitely not an illusion. And for good reason, since we have come into this time-space reality with the intention of having a great time and enjoying ourselves. We have intended to use our physical bodies to enjoy the richness of what this time-space reality has to offer. We have intended to immerse ourselves fully and play in this wonderful playground, learning and growing as we go along. Whenever we experience something we do not like, we would immediately set an intention for it to be better. If we hold ourselves in a truly non-resistant state and just trust that everything is, already, all right, if we simply hold and focus all our attention on what is wanted, then what is wanted would manifest very quickly for us. And so it would be a game we play for the rest of our lives, to notice what is not wanted, from which something wanted is born, and then to give all our wholehearted attention to that which is wanted and watch it magically unfold in our lives. What I have just described in the last paragraph is the simplest premise that underlies almost every single self-help or spiritual book in the history of mankind, except the ones that believe you have to suffer to really gain anything in life, which really stem from a lack of understanding or misinterpretation of the original message. Different authors may of course phrase it in various ways, from you create your own reality, Seth, to you become what you think about, Earl Nightingale, to success is your own damn fault. Larry Winget. Full confession though, I have not felt led to read any of his books. Some authors obviously bring their points across more elegantly than others, so pick those that work for you. This way of living seems so obvious to me today, and it is how I live my life today, but just a few years ago, it would have been unimaginable. My logical, rational, scientifically trained mind, with all its years of education, could never have been able to grasp such a simple premise and would have rejected it outright. Common objections that I struggled with include. Life can't be that simple. There has to be some higher logic tying everything together. And my then favorite, if things were these simple, everyone would be happy and successful by now. Let me assure you right now, that whatever higher logic, reasons, and mystical secrets that you are looking for simply do not exist. Life is as simple and easy as you allow it to be. Life has no ulterior motives. Because life is, it respects all your decisions and choices. Even those unconscious ones you may have to make it as difficult or painful as you would like it to be. Either way, life plays with you the way you want it. I have tried it both ways, and I like the simple, easy, flowing way much more than the painful and suffering way I unconsciously adopted in my early life. Readers of my earlier books will know that I talk extensively about conditioning, and the effects of unconscious negative conditioning on an individual. For example, 
If we have always been trained to think in a certain way, then the pattern of thought becomes very familiar to us and we tend to entertain the same train of thoughts. To a certain extent, thinking the same familiar thoughts feels comfortable and safe to us. Suppose you frequently take a particular route to work daily, and one day you decide to take a detour, to go off the trodden path. Because there is no path where you now intend to walk, so you must create your own, possibly by trampling over a patch of grass or even by stepping over a bed of flowers. How does it feel the first few times you do so? It will of course feel uncomfortable and weird. People will be staring at you, and you will no doubt feel uncomfortable and extremely self-conscious. But let's suppose that you keep at it daily, and you do it often enough. Before long, others who have seen you take this alternative path will start following in your footsteps. The alternative path, which did not exist in the first place, now becomes the new normal to you, and a physical path has just been created. The grass and flowers which you and so many others have trampled upon repeatedly would no longer grow in their original spots, resulting in the creation of a new familiar path. This is the way with our minds as well. When we are trying to make a change in ourselves, it is never easy. Our old selves will tend to hold or rein us back, because our old self is simply a collection of thought patterns and beliefs that we have held dear to our hearts for so long. Making any change will feel difficult or even unnatural at the beginning, and any unpleasant, uncomfortable feelings are simply feelings of you being thrust into the unknown, into the void of all possibilities. I wish to emphasize this strongly at the beginning of this book because the feeling of unfamiliarity or fear of the unknown keeps many people from living their greater good. It keeps people from making positive and beneficial changes in their lives, simply because they have identified so strongly with their current selves. While a part of them wants to change, the larger part of them is fearful of moving into the unknown and just trusting in the intelligence of it all. This fear often manifests itself as a feeling of uncertainty or anxiety, a deep-seated feeling that something bad is about to happen, which then causes them to pull back and revert back to their old familiar selves. You may notice this pattern in your own life, where you try something out for a while and after not seeing any results, revert back to your old beliefs and old way of functioning. Even a thought as innocent as nothing works for me can be a pervasive and imprisoning belief. There have been many teachings about the usefulness of such an innate protection system, as irritating as it may seem. Obviously, it keeps us safe and gives us a structure from which to create from. It is the glue that holds everything together. You would not want your world to change drastically from one second to the next before you have found your footing. Neither would you want your thoughts to create your reality so instantaneously that you end up getting confused, overwhelmed, and bewildered. Take a moment now to ponder how it would be like if everything physically manifested for you instantaneously. Imagine what would happen if your worry thoughts, your negative thoughts and your positive thoughts came true in physical form for you all at once in the blink of an eye. Your life would be quite dramatic indeed, and it can be quite funny. Thankfully, the intelligent universe does not allow this to happen in our current time-space reality through the concept of time. If you learn to master time, you learn to master the art of manifestation. Playtime. Close your eyes. Take one to two minutes to imagine what life would be like if every single thought, negative and positive, resulted in a physical manifestation the moment you think it. Would you feel overjoyed or overwhelmed? After I wrote the previous paragraph, I closed my eyes for a moment and imagined what would happen in an alternate universe where thoughts become things instantly, with the alternate universe's response in parenthesis. Wow! What a nice red sports car to own! Poof! A nice red car instantly appears in your driveway. I wish I could afford it. The maintenance is sure going to be expensive. Poof! The red car instantly disappears as the universe responds to your thought of not being able to afford it. It is sure expensive to own a thing like that. Nothing happens. But still, it would be nice to own one. Poof, the car appears again. I can't believe the car is now mine. Poof, the car disappears again. Where is my car? It was here a moment ago. Give me my car now. Nothing happens. Well maybe it will show up again later. Poof, the car appears again, for the third time. Good. Now that it's mine, I hope the birds don't poop all over it. 
Look at what the birds have done. I need that cleaned up immediately. Car is polished and gleaming brightly again. Great. Time for me to set off for my appointment. Hope I'm not going to meet one of those new drivers who can't drive. You get the idea. A universe in which all your thoughts manifest instantly in physical form is only beneficial if you are a master at thought control, as seen from the above negative example. All of your thoughts would have to be exceedingly positive and in the same direction, in order to keep creating a string of desired results. Otherwise, a single negative thought may annihilate all the good work done earlier, resulting in the need to start all over again. I'm sure you can come up with equally hilarious scenarios for yourself. Add to that the thousands of thoughts racing through our mind at any one time, and you suddenly appreciate how things are structured in our current time-space reality. In an alternate universe where thoughts become things instantly, even small fears would manifest in an instant, and our attention to those manifested monsters would then turn into bigger and bigger nightmares, until things go out of control. We also have to be very clear and definite about our intentions the first time round in this alternate reality to make sure we get precisely what we want. Otherwise, a lot of, of time would have to be spent later on cleaning things up and undoing our earlier manifestations. I am taking this example to its extreme because some readers feel that spiritual teachers are flip-flopping on the effectiveness of the law of attraction when they explain that there has to be a buffer of time before physical manifestation takes place. They simply cannot see a reason as to why there has to be a passage of time, which is understandable because we usually want our stuff very, very badly. Some skeptics see this as an excuse used by most authors to explain why certain things do not manifest in our lives, or why certain things are still not yet manifest despite working on them for long periods of time. But instead of seeing the passage of time as a foe, start seeing it as your ally in manifestation. As I've mentioned before, Master the way you perceive time, and you master the art of manifestation. Appreciate it because this mandatory passage of time means you can change your mind freely, without having to spend time undoing your earlier unwanted physical creations. Appreciate the beauty and consistency of it all because this passage of time means that your negative and worst fears do not come into effect immediately and will usually be neutralized by your positive thoughts. Overall, there are way more benefits to having a time buffer in place which is why there has been a collective agreement to put it there in the first place. It serves our highest good. I seldom use the phrase the law of attraction because it implies that there is something out there, which we then have to attract into our lives. But if you really make a study of spiritual teachings, you'll realize that at its most fundamental level, the law of attraction is really talking about the attraction of thought forms. In other words, positive thoughts attract other positive thoughts, and negative thoughts attract other negative thoughts. It is easy to see this phenomenon at work in our daily lives, when I think about something good that makes me feel happy, more good feeling thoughts come to me and I feel more and more uplifted as I think those thoughts. However, when I'm in a negative, downward spiral of thoughts, each thought feels worse than the next, and before long I have a very dire view of the situation. So moving from one thought to another, how one thought spontaneously wells up after the previous one, is actually the law of attraction in action. Try as we might, we are unable to stop it from happening. It is a natural law of the universe that we live in. So now that you understand the basics of why some time has to pass before you get what you want, here's the million dollar question, how do you master time to get what you want? What do you do in the meantime? Chapter 3, How the Universe Always Responds Instantly in the previous chapter, we discussed the benefits of living in a time-space reality where there is a buffer of time before our intentions, wishes, and desires become manifest in physical reality. Once you are able to come to terms with the existence of this physical time buffer and see it as your ally in manifestations, things will happen for you very quickly, because this issue of waiting time no longer sticks out like a sore thumb. Remember that the universe is always picking up on the sum total of your intentions, as I mentioned in my book Band Manifestation Secrets. You can never fool or pull wool over the universe's eyes. When you feel impatient or stuck, when you wonder why your physical manifestations are taking such a long time, the law of attraction is picking up on those feelings as well and not surprisingly, you manifest more stuckness. On the other hand, if you make peace with the fact that there is a time buffer, and you come to terms and appreciate the beauty of how things are, 
when you see that the ultimate purpose of this time buffer is really for your benefit, then you are letting in more of the flow and goodness of the universe. It is that simple. Before I made the realizations in the previous chapter, I too, had the most difficult time accepting the existence of a physical time buffer. To me back then, any delay between the setting of my intentions and the ultimate physical manifestation of my dreams only made me more focused on the lack of it all, which in turn perpetuated the negativity and lack cycle. Fortunately once I saw things in their right perspective and gained a deeper understanding of the universal laws, things became easy and flowing for me. Today, I no longer worry about when my physical manifestations are going to arrive. I don't even worry about if and how. The moment I set an intention, I know that if I do not contradict it internally, the universe will automatically bring it to fruition. Once you are able to reach this deep level of childlike trust, things happen very quickly for you. But you must get to the place of deep faith and trust first. While teaching that there is a buffer of time needed before our desires are made manifest in this physical reality, spiritual teachers also mentioned that there is no delay between the moment of asking and the universe responding. In the beginning, this point tripped me up a lot and I could not seem to reconcile the two opposing points of view. If the universe always responds to my desires and wishes instantly, then why is there a delay in my physical manifestation? This is the point which we are going to delve deeper into next, and if you understand this part of the creative process, the rest falls in place very easily for you. Many of our spiritual truths cannot be understood through mere intellectual understanding. One can read about these laws and agree that they sound very logical and reasonable indeed, but putting them into action is another story. I liken this to learning math in school. Reading all the formulas and theorems in the textbooks all seemed well and good, until we were made to apply them to the questions. Suddenly, things did not seem that clear-cut anymore. I bring up this example because I want you to know it is absolutely alright to feel uncertain or confusion during each stage of your spiritual journey. There will be times when you are filled with doubts or questions, but how you embrace your feelings of uncertainty or confusion makes all the difference in the world. Let me repeat this again as it is an important lesson, how you handle and embrace your feelings of uncertainty makes all the difference, which means, it ultimately influences the results which you get. In the previous chapter, I talked about there being an unknown void when you wish to create something new in your life. Similarly, one cannot just step into this new life instantly without there being some nagging feelings of doubt, or feelings about how unnatural it feels. Of course it feels unnatural. Because your body and mind have not been accustomed to thinking in this manner before, you are using your mind and body in a completely new way. So while I was trying to reconcile the differences between there being a time buffer before our physical manifestations appeared, and the universe responding instantaneously without any delay to our desires and intentions. I was momentarily thrust into a state of void or unknown. I was confronted with two seemingly opposing thoughts, and these produced feelings of discord or unnaturalness for me. Psychologists call this cognitive dissonance. How did I handle this dissonance? I simply did nothing and sat through it. I did not know it back then, but I did the right thing. The right thing was to do nothing, and simply let those two opposing thoughts sit in my mind and to look at each of them curiously. If you will allow yourself to spend some time in the void each day, not seeking to know or find all the answers, it will be one of the most worthwhile experiences in your journey. We will talk about stepping into the void in subsequent chapters, because the void where all uncertainties and unknowns exist is the space of infinite possibilities. Because nothing is fixed, or certain, everything exists as a probability slash possibility in the void. It is then up to you, as the conscious observer, to choose, with your intentions, which realities you would like to experience. One day, as I was sitting through one of the guided meditations of renowned meditation teacher Jed Amali, I suddenly got it. In her guided meditation, Jeda was gently guiding us through holding intentions of love and other good feelings, and feeling how our body instantly responded to our intention with its own unique feeling and blueprint of love. Of course, you can do it right now as you are reading the words on this page. Make an intention to be love, and see how your body instantly responds with the welling up of a warm, happy feeling. Then make an intention to be peace, and observe how your body instantly responds with another good feeling. Notice that the feeling of peace is somewhat different from love, 
and you can tell one apart from the other. It goes without saying that this exercise can be repeated with any of the negative feelings as well, such as anger, greed, or despair, but why deliberately hold intentions of unwanted feelings? What I realized in that moment of epiphany, was that the universe is indeed responding instantaneously to all our feelings, thoughts, intentions, and desires. It responds through our feelings. In other words, the universe responds unfailingly and we can feel its response in the form of feelings, which we have come to identify as bodily sensations. In the moment we set an intention to be love or loving, even with no particular object or target in mind, the universe, our bodies, respond and we feel love. There is no time buffer needed for that. The universe responds instantaneously, regardless of external circumstances, regardless of any excuses you may have as to why you cannot or should not feel love. You can play with this all day and see the unfailing nature of universal laws at play for you. Universal laws are so dependable that you can depend on them at any time, in any circumstance. That is why your manifestations have to happen. It is law. Playtime. Close your eyes and set an intention to feel love. Notice how the universe, your body, instantly responds with feelings you associate with love, feelings that you can recognize as love. Now ask yourself, where were these feelings a moment ago before you held the intention? Feel these feelings and make them more intense, become aware of them as energy, vibrations, goosebumps in your body. This is your body's interpretation of the energy. Now make an intention to feel a different feeling, pick one of your choice, notice how your body instantly responds to that feeling as well. You can switch between various feelings and have the universe respond instantaneously to each of them, because there is absolutely no delay in the universe's response. It is always there for you. The last line is worth repeating, there is absolutely no delay in the universe's response. The universe is always there for you. In this exercise we used the feelings of love and peace. These are broader good feelings which are easy for many people to get into. However, you can also substitute this with more refined intentions, such as abundance. In fact, let's try that right now. Hold an intention for abundance and see how the universe instantly responds to your intention. Once again, there is no delay. However, some may have difficulties holding an intention of abundance because their conscious-slash-rational minds instantly contradict this intention, giving them reasons why they should not feel abundant. For a person who has been negatively conditioned most of his-slash-her life, he-slash-she may find it difficult to even hold a pure intention for abundance without having some contradictory thoughts or reverting back to the familiar feelings of lack. For example, the rational mind may instantly say, Who are you to feel abundant? You are dollar underscore 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 in debt, or more insidiously, it may say, what is the use of you feeling abundant? It will not cause money to instantly appear in your bank account, you are wasting your time with this silly exercise. Ah! Stay with me for a moment. The rational mind always interprets events, circumstances, and conditions in line with its most strongly held beliefs. Remember that the purpose of the ego, or the conscious rational mind is to keep you safe. It does not want you to go into the void of the unknown, even if it's just an inner, spiritual void, because anything unknown is considered to be unchanged artered territory and therefore dangerous. So if you have been negatively conditioned all your life to believe in lack and suddenly hold an intention for abundance, how do you think your body will react? It will be thrown into a state of uncertainty and confusion, because you have never felt abundant before. You have been so used and conditioned to the feelings of lack, that an abundant feeling is so far from what you are used to. Feelings of lack, while disempowering and as painful as they may be, actually feel more familiar to you. In order to step into a new state of being, you need to pass through the void or unknown. This is when your reasoning, conscious, reasoning mind gives you reasons and excuses to doubt yourself. These excuses may even seem very clever and totally logical in the first place, especially the second one about these exercises being silly and a waste of time. Now, here's the key to breaking through this resistance, do you want to believe in them? You have the power at any time to accept or reject any thought that your ego or reasoning mind is trying to tell you. If you belong to the vast majority of the population that says, well, my inner critic is right. I should not be wasting time on these exercises. After all, 
It will not cause money to suddenly appear in my bank account. I better be on my way to look for other secrets, then your ego has succeeded in keeping you safe, but at what cost? Everything will still be the same old, same old. But, if you recognize the dependability of these universal laws and operate from a higher level of consciousness, if you recognize that these logical objections given by your rational self are simply false beliefs stemming from long-term lack in the past, you can simply stop believing in them right now. Quoting a phrase from Abraham Hicks, a belief is simply a thought you keep thinking over and over again. Therefore, I have the power to reject any beliefs that do not serve me, and replace them with more empowering beliefs. I want to believe in something that serves me. So back to the earlier example of you holding an intention for abundance. If you manage to cut through all the mind chatter and allow yourself to hold the intention for abundance purely, the universe responds instantly and it is one of the most beautiful things that can happen to you. You start to realize, perhaps for the first time in your life, that these feelings of abundance are separate from any physical time and space reality. They are separate from any physical conditions. They are unconditional. The moment you make an intention to feel abundant, to be abundance, the universe responds unfailingly. And now, if you allow yourself to remain in this state of total abundance, to immerse yourself in this state of abundance for most of the time, not because you want something to happen but because the feeling just feels so good for you, then seemingly outer circumstances, we know there is really no out there, will start responding to this new inner state that you have cultivated. Old feelings of lack and not enough will melt away, because you have now stepped into a new reality for yourself. Remember, you can decide to hold a new intention at any time and the universe will respond immediately. You can do it this today, tomorrow, or five years down the road when you've finally had enough. The universe's response is not subject to the same physical time or space limitations which you may perceive from your end. Simply put, time and space limitations do not even matter to the universe, so why worry about them? Don't worry about current circumstances or how things currently are. Do not use those as an excuse you hold yourself back. Let all of the worrying go and focus purely on holding your intentions, for joy, love, abundance, or whatever you want. It was not until I started doing this consciously three times a day that things started to turn around for me. But you have to take the first step, only then does the universe respond to your new intentions. Chapter 4, The Illusion of Time I admit I used to have a rather conventional view of time. Just like everyone else, I viewed time as being finite, in which there was only so much to go around. I viewed time in a strictly linear fashion, with us moving ahead in time from one point to the next. Like many others, I was often pressed for time and felt that I had not enough time. Without even realizing it, my limited concept of time was imprisoning me instead of empowering me. Unless one truly understands the illusion of time, we will always feel trapped and imprisoned by it. A person who does not understand the true nature and purpose of time will constantly be berating the passing of time until the physical manifestation finally shows up. This person is also likely to feel restricted as each day goes by, as he perceives that time is running out, or that there is not enough time to do all the things that need to get done. When we are young, these misguided beliefs often do not surface. But as an individual gets older, these beliefs start coming to the surface and what follows is often a difficult emotional period where one feels guilty about having wasted so much time in the past, or feels a sense of sadness that there is no longer enough time to fulfill all of one's goals or desires in life. Fortunately, time is merely an illusion in our current time-space reality, just as space is an illusion. I know it may be difficult for you to accept this statement at face value, just as it was difficult for me to do so in the beginning. After all, the whole concept of our society has been built upon a common understanding of time, and any violations of this understanding can have very serious social repercussions indeed. For example, your co-workers and friends aren't going to be pleased if you start showing up a few hours late for your appointments. Yet at the same time, I'm sure you have heard stories of time slowing down for various individuals when accidents happened or at urgent, life-threatening moments. You may even have had such experiences yourself. The reverse is also true. You may have felt time speeding up when you were enjoying yourself and having a good time, looking at the clock to discover that a few hours have passed, when they felt like minutes to you. 
If you've had any of these experiences in the past, I invite you to re-examine your beliefs about time. The fact that time can appear to pass faster or slower shows time is perceptual in nature. It is something we constantly perceive to be faster or slower. If time is truly a finite unit that exists independently of the observer, then we should all have the same experience of it, and our perceptions of it should not differ from one person to the next. A friend of mine once told me this wonderful experience which happened to him. I have since heard similar stories from around the world. Once, my friend was involved in a baton passing relay race. As you may know, the dropping of the baton in a relay means that the team is disqualified, hence great care has to be taken to ensure that the baton is not accidentally dropped. As my friend was receiving the baton from the previous runner, the baton slipped out of his hands and, to his horror, started falling towards the ground. Much to his amazement, instead of the baton hitting the ground as it normally would, it actually ended up being suspended in midair, waiting for him to catch it. After he had gotten over his initial amazement, he quickly reached out to grab the baton which was magically hovering inches away from the floor, and went on to complete the race. I love this story because it wonderfully illustrates the perceptual nature of time. Would the other competitors and spectators have noticed the baton hovering in midair, matrix style, had they been watching my friend that day? No, they would have not. Time would have passed normally for them, and no one would notice anything amiss. But because time is perceptual in nature depending on the observer, time appeared to slow itself down for my friend. Put differently, my friend slowed down his perception of time so he had the opportunity to react and prevent the baton from dropping on the floor. I can't tell you how many similar stories I have read from around the world. Stories about events appearing to slow down during an accident, which would then allow the individual to react in time to avert disaster. These stories suggest that time is very bendable indeed. I told my friend that there could be a few reasons for his miraculous experience. First, he knew that dropping the baton would lead to an undesirable outcome, and therefore he had implicitly set a higher intention to avoid that outcome. Reality therefore yielded to him to fulfill that intention. Second, he was in a flow state, a very focused state of mind during the competition. A very focused and interdirected state puts us in tune with the rhythm of the universe, where we allow universal energy to simply work through us without resisting any of the flow. While I had only experienced that time seemed to pass faster or slower for me depending on whether I was engrossed in the activity I was doing. I never had any conscious experiences of altering my perception of time until I read an excellent book by spiritual author and psychologist Gay Hendricks. In one chapter of his book The Big Leap, Gay introduces his concept of Einstein time, which stands in contrast to Newtonian time. The Newtonian school views time as finite, in limited supply and progressing in a strictly linear fashion. On the other hand, the concept of Einstein time views time as relative to the observer. I immediately fell in love with the concept of Einstein time the moment I read about it, because it was an invitation for me to truly play with this concept. Up till that moment, I had only read about such amazing time experiences happening to others but never really experienced such things myself. I always thought that these experiences happened spontaneously, by chance. However, after reading Hendrick's chapter about Einstein time, I came to the realization that since time is an illusion in itself, Perhaps all of us can try our hand at altering our perception of time to our benefit. There have been many scientific theories postulated about time. In scientific terms, time is a scalar, and one of the dimensions of our three-dimensional world. The conventional view is that time can only move forward but not backwards. However, scientists also suggest that time is a way we use to organize and make sense of events. We use time to delineate the order of events such that there will be events that happened first, and subsequent events that happened later. If there is no concept of time, everything would appear to us as happening at the single point of now. Spiritual teachers often allude to time as an illusion, and that there is no time, there is only the here and now. Now is the only present moment you have, and no matter which moment you're at, it's always now, now, and now. So it follows that these two concepts actually complement one another, on one hand, there is no time. We can never really perceive the passage of time. There is only now. Our subconscious minds, as an extension of higher universal intelligence, 
have a hard time perceiving linear time, as there is only now. Everything is happening right now. On the other hand, our conscious minds need to use time as some sort of a filing cabinet, to organize the events in our lives in a kind of chronological order to give order, meaning and logic to our lives. If everything happened at a single point to us, it would be very difficult to perceive what was happening. Perhaps the most striking evidence of time being an illusion are the accounts of individuals who have had near-death experiences. These individuals often report a feeling of timelessness, where everything seems to be happening at once, in which they are simultaneously aware of everything happening at once. Obviously, time serves an important purpose in our lives, which is to allow us to perceive and enjoy the experiences that happen to us. However, what happens when we view time as a burden instead of an empowering concept? This is where so many people fall into the trap. Recall the previous chapter when we discussed the time buffer before physical manifestations occur? Most people see this time buffer as a hindrance, rather than an aid. Gay Hendricks in his book offers an enlightening affirmation to use, which I have since expanded and adapted for my own use. The statement goes like this, you're where time comes from. I prefer to say it as, I am where time comes from. Some people may have trouble grasping that, so I suggest using this statement instead, time, like everything else, is energy. Think of time as a construct, a man-created concept, as it is done in modern timekeeping where use elaborate watches, clocks, and a whole network of atomic clocks to keep time. Our world would be very different if we did not keep track of the passage of time. But more fundamentally, recognize that time is an illusion, and is up to how we choose to perceive it. Our time-related experiences are related to how we perceive time, and we can change our perceptions of time at any moment. It did not occur to me how often I was looking at my watch during the course of a day, simply for no other reason but to know the current time. This habit did not hit me until I started consciously practicing the exercises I'm about to share with you in this chapter. I realized that I was looking at my watch and my clocks throughout the day out of sheer habit and for no particular reason. Most of the time, I was not even going for a meeting or keeping track of time to be punctual for an appointment. My mind had simply been conditioned to use the passage of time as a means of keeping track of life. If this sounds familiar to you, it will be a very liberating experience to stop doing it, at least for the time being. The next playtime activity offers some helpful suggestions to do so. Playtime, whenever you feel the urge to look at a clock or watch out of habit, especially if there is no need to do so, stop and say silently to yourself, time is an illusion. I am where time comes from. I can make more time when I need it. If you do this consistently throughout a few days or weeks, it will be one of the most liberating experiences in your life. I took this practice a step further and started trying it out in times when I thought I would be late. Guess what, ever since adopting this new belief that time is simply an illusion, I have never been late for an appointment. Whereas in the past, I would often arrive late, frantic, and apologetic. I do realize you may need some concrete examples, so here are two most recent examples as I write this. The first occurred when I was scheduled for a lunch appointment at 2.30 p.m. When I left my house at 2.15 p.m., the traffic conditions immediately made it clear that I would be late. In the past, this would have led me to be panicky and frazzled. I would have felt the urge to text my friend while driving, and inform them I would be late by 10 to 15 minutes. Then I would keep looking at my watch to ensure that I kept to this new timing. However, that would be the old way of functioning for me. I decided to put my new knowledge into practice. Throughout the journey, I resisted the strong urge to look at the watch and kept telling myself, time is an illusion. I am where time comes from. I can make more time when I need it. Guess what happened? I was feeling so comfortable with my new practice that I felt no rush, and a deep sense of peace and relaxation. When I reached the mall, I even had time to go to the washroom before making my way to the restaurant. Just as I was walking towards the restaurant, I spotted my friend walking towards the entrance too. He was surprised at the synchronicity of it all, and I was secretly surprised, at how the universe ensured that everything happened for both of us in perfect timing. Trust me, had I been functioning in my old mode of reacting to and worrying about time, I would have been a panicky mess by the time I reached the restaurant, 
on top of making dozens of phone calls and text messages to tell my friend that I would not be there on time. The second experience occurred when I was driving to an important seminar, at which it was important to arrive on time. Once again, traffic conditions made it clear that I would be late. To make matters worse, there were no parking lots available when I reached the venue, which meant I had to park at a further car park and take a longer walk than usual. Again, knowing what I now know, I resisted the constant urge to look at my watch and repeated, I am where time comes from. I can make more time if needed. The seminar was slated to begin at 2.30 p.m., and the first surprise was that I was not as late as I had imagined. When I finally glanced at my watch as I walked into the room, it was only five minutes past 2.30. The next surprise was that a technical glitch had occurred in the setting up of the conferencing equipment, which resulted in the seminar not starting until 2.50 p.m. I was therefore on time, and missed nothing. The universe truly orchestrates everything in divine timing. Whenever you see through an illusion, it collapses. I encourage you to do the same too with the concept of time. Of course, I'm not advocating that you start turning up late for all your appointments and start disregarding punctuality altogether. What I'm saying is that it helps to remind yourself once in a while that time is simply an illusion, and that you can control your perception of time. You can make more of it if you need it, but do not make too much lest you get bored. Ever since adopting this playful mindset of time and fully allowing myself to experiment with it, I've had incredibly productive days. I no longer feel rushed or pressed for time. I never say, I have not enough time to do everything I need to do. I know a friend who says this all the time, and he is one of the most stressed out individuals I know, constantly feeling squeezed for time. When I feel the need for more time, I simply say, okay, time is just an illusion so let me stretch and make more of it. Everything happens in its own perfect time. Ever since setting this new intention and stepping into this new reality for myself, I've had incredibly productive days. The day just seems to stretch to accommodate all my activities, be it the time I need to write, come up with new ideas, exercise, or run my errands. Life is so much freer and more fun now. I sincerely invite you to try the techniques in this chapter and see them work in your own life. As with everything else in this book, the only way to know is to try it first. Chapter 5, The Weight is Always Optional Let's review what we have learned up to this point. So far, we have clarified the purpose of the time buffer needed before physical manifestations take place, and why this time buffer is beneficial to you. We also talked about how the universe responds instantaneously to your intentions, by virtue of letting you feel certain emotions the moment you hold a thought or intention in your mind. This is the most fundamental phenomenon of the law of attraction, the instantaneous attraction of like energy in the form of thoughts and feelings. Then in the previous chapter, we talked about the illusory nature of time, and how you can alter your perception and experience of time at will. Human time is a concept we have come up with to allow us to make sense of, and to organize the events that happen in our lives in a meaningful way. As the saying, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward shows, human beings rely on time to interpret and add meaning to the events in their lives. Very often, we look back at seemingly bad things that happened in our past and start seeing the greater good in them. But we can only see the greater message with the benefit of hindsight. Of course, there are also times when we give bad labels or interpretations to events, which then stay with us for the rest of our lives. It is the interpretation of these events that causes problems for us, rather than the event itself. As such, there are numerous therapy techniques built around the concept of a timeline in neurolinguistic programming, NLP, and in other healing modalities, which involve an individual going back and changing certain past events in their timeline to remove the negative charge of it. To your higher self and unconscious mind, the concept of linear time is difficult for to understand. There is no time. There is only the here and now. Yet on the other hand, your conscious mind relies on time to organize its thoughts, and to keep you sane. In order to be an effective manifester, you must learn how to bridge the gap between these two seemingly disparate concepts. How do you live in a world structured around physical time, and yet be of no time? How do you accept that your physical manifestations will come in time, and still act as if they are already here? 
The exercises shared in the previous chapter, in which you resist urges to keep looking at your watch and remind yourself about the illusory nature of time will aid you greatly in mastering this. These are two key areas, that once mastered, will allow you to be a very effective conscious manifester. I often mention in my teachings that the only reason why the physical stuff has not appeared in your life yet, is your constant contradiction of it. For example, while you may say I want a new red sports car, your next associated, conditioned, thought of but how am I going to afford it, has effectively nullified the first intention. Most people thus go through most of their days unconsciously, taking one step forward but two steps back, thinking something and then nullifying it with another statement. Most people make some progress and then erase it with associated negative and fear thoughts. In order to make progress in your desired direction and get closer to the physical manifestation, your thoughts need to be aligned in a single direction. The more you train yourself to be able to do that, the faster your manifestations will happen for you. If your thoughts are going in both directions, both towards and away from your manifestations, it will then seem that your manifestations are taking a long time. But that is only because you are making use of the time buffer to clarify your intentions. Each time you think or feel a negative or nullifying thought, the universe does not see it as something bad or unwanted. The universe does not judge. Instead, it is responding perfectly to the nature of your thoughts, and treating it completely neutrally as a process of you clarifying your intentions. The universe is always acting on your behalf. Recall the earlier exercise in which you closed your eyes and held the intention of love. The universe responded instantly by letting you feel that unique feeling of love, which you instantly recognize to be love, in which no words or labels are necessary. In the same vein, the universe is always responding unfailingly to your thoughts and intentions. Now let's suppose you keep yourself focused on your intention for a longer period of time. What happens is that the feelings of love usually get more and more intense, until you now start to feel love at a higher level than before. If at this moment, you were to suddenly think an angry or depressed thought, which may not be easy if you are vibrating at a high energetic level, but let's say something attracts your attention enough for you to change your thoughts, how will you feel? You will instantly go from feeling love to feeling anger or despair. The process is almost instantaneous. The moment you give your attention to that new contradictory thought, you feel it in your body, in every cell of your being. Now let's suppose that you want to feel love again, so you set the intention again and the universe responds again, but in the process you have taken a longer time because of the detour you took in the middle when you felt something contrary to your original intention. Can you see how this situation parallels the process of failed or delayed manifestations for so many people? The stuff is not coming not because the process does not work, but because the process works too well. The universe is always giving to you, at the precise moment, whatever is called for by you. Let's say you manage to hold the intention of love for a long period of time, until you feel so good that you immerse yourself in the good feelings of it. If you manage to do so long enough, completely immersing yourself in the good euphoric feelings of love, then every single thing that you have ever desired and all the right things will be delivered into your life in the most perfect way possible. I know it feels strange now as you are reading these words, especially if you've never had this experience before. It defies all logic. You may be thinking, how can a person sitting there, silently by himself and holding the intention of feeling good have good things happen to him? He should be doing something instead of sitting on the couch. Well, First recognize that the statement above is a misplaced belief in taking action. Second, it is my own personal experience that a person holding a good feeling state will not be able to remain still in that state for too long. What I have found, which you can discover for yourself too, is that once you start vibrating at higher and higher levels of good feelings, you start becoming closer to your divine source. You start allowing the goodness of the universe to flow through you. At that moment, you receive all the insights and impulses you need for the fulfillment of your life. In fact, inaction will be impossible as these impulses become too strong for you to ignore. Any action you take will then feel very natural to you. Have you ever felt a strong impulse to do something, and just knew that everything would turn out right if you followed that inner guidance? I have, and I can't tell you how many times following my impulses have led me to the right book, the right person, or the right circumstances. In fact, 
I can't even recall an instance in my life when these supposed impulses caused me any harm. Not one single episode. I hesitate to even call them impulses because I know I did not act on impulse, which usually implies a kind of rashness, acting before something is ready. Instead, I know that my actions were backed by a gentle universal force, and were born from me being in the flow of the universe. When you give up resisting and allow the universe to guide you, life become effortless for you. You merge with the universal flow and become one with the divine. It is as if there is no separation between you and divinity, and doors open for you at every turn. This makes sense once we look at things from the perspective of the divine, from the perspective of our higher consciousness. To the divine, there is no conception of time. Everything is happening here and now. When you ask, it is answered for you here and now. Any time delay is therefore perceptual and a product of our own consciousness. If we frequently contradict our intentions, then we will perceive the intervening time as a delay in terms of physical time. If we are strongly aligned to our desires, and hold coherent intentions, then no time delay is necessary or will even be perceived. Everything comes in its own perfect time. The perfect analogy for this is when you order something on Amazon. You know, as much as you look forward to receiving your parcel, that it is on its way, and it is so. You place your faith and trust in Amazon's ordering and fulfillment systems, and you are not particularly worried about things going wrong, because even if they did, Amazon has a system to set things right for you. Let it be the same for your universal desires. Once you have set your intention, rest in the knowledge that the universe is acting on it. It is picking your order out right now and delivering it to you. The universe is already responding to bring whatever you want to you. You now know that this is not acting on blind faith, but acting with a firm faith in universal law. Through the earlier exercises in this book, you have had first-hand, personal experience of the universe responding instantaneously to your intentions in the form of feelings, which is nothing more than an energy pattern which you interpret. Therefore, if the universe responds instantaneously when you hold an intention to feel a certain way, it must also respond instantly when you hold an intention to be or have a particular thing. While you would very much like your Amazon package to appear on your doorsteps instantly, you also accept that there is a buffer of time. In this sense, you understand that there is a delivery process that needs to take place. The order needs to be picked from the warehouse, packaged, and then sent on the delivery truck. The courier will then deliver it to your doorsteps. You do not question this process too much in the physical world, and you just trust it to do its job. Let the same be the case for your manifestations. Know that an unseen process is orchestrating everything behind the scenes, just as how you do not need to know the way FedEx or UPS schedules all its routes, or the intricate system of networks used to deliver your order to you. You just know it is done the moment you order it. In the same way, the universe is working its magic, coordinating all the small pieces that fit together to deliver your order to you. Just as you accept that your order will appear at your doorsteps in one to two days, rush shipping is always available, you can also go for the rush shipping option on your universal desires. But here, instead of telling it to be rushed, you need to tell yourself the opposite to feel very relaxed. You remind yourself that everything is happening in its own perfect time, and that the wait is optional. Remind yourself that while you wait, there are just as many things for you to occupy yourself with. There is no need to sit there waiting for the thing to appear, for a watched pot never boils. Watching an empty space and waiting for something to happen is placing more attention on lack. So don't even fall into this trap of watching something, and observing or tracking its every move. Spiritual teachers have taught this time and time again, that when you grow a seed, you do not dig it up every few days to check whether it has grown. You will kill the seed in the process. And so the same applies in modern terms. After you have cast your intention, don't keep checking in physical reality to see whether it has manifested. Know that it will arrive, just as your Amazon order will arrive. Know that your perception of time is an illusion, and you can perceive time to be as short or as long as you like. Rest in the knowledge and satisfaction that while your universal order is being filled, you can partake in many equally meaningful and joyful things which will then lead you on to more and more enjoyable things. The only job you have is to decide what you want, and to step aside and let it happen. Chapter 6, What Really Happens When You Visualize?
Most people have a misguided view of visualization. Clearing up these views and clarifying what happens will be very useful, as these misguided beliefs often present themselves as resistance that slow down the manifestation process. Visualization, just like meditation, is an often misunderstood process. There are some who sit in vain and visualize all day, hoping that what they want will suddenly pop into their experience. Then there are others who eschew it completely, considering it a waste of time. The sweet spot is actually the happy middle ground, where you neither spend too much time visualizing nor not do it at all. I visualize three times a day, for just a few minutes each time, rarely exceeding five minutes, along with all the practices that I share in my other books. And I'll explain the logic behind this later. But first, understand that the amount of weight or delay you experience before physical demonstrations happen in your life is in direct proportion to the amount of resistance you offer, and your beliefs about the role played by space slash time in the process. Therefore, a small shift in perception can indeed produce a huge change in actual, physical results. The first few chapters of this book have hopefully shifted your perceptions a bit, through all the anecdotes, exercises, and examples I have shared. In this chapter, we'll discuss the concept of space. Many people see visualization as a spatial concept. They see themselves as sitting in some familiar spot in their home, such as in their favorite armchair in the living room, and then strongly sending out visual images, signals, that will somehow be picked up on by the universe. Then, through the magnetic power of their thoughts, feelings, and emotions, similar events and circumstances are drawn to them like a magnet from the external world. While the above metaphor is helpful for explaining how visualizations work to a beginner, it is not very resourceful for someone who intends to go beyond the beginner stage, to be an effective and conscious manifester in his or her life. Most people who believe in the magnetic attraction metaphor of using their thoughts to attract physical events, things, and people into their lives end up questioning whether they are sending their signals out in the right way to the universe. They end up obsessing over the actual process or method by which they send out their signals to the universe. They are worried that if they do not do so correctly, the universe will not be able to pick up their signals accurately and act on them accurately. As I have mentioned, this is a misguided and disempowering view. Proponents of this view often emphasize the need to visualize or meditate for long hours on end, or to state their intentions over and over again for fear that the universe is not receiving it properly like a faulty television set. Think back to a time when something physically manifested for you, in which you did not spend too much time trying to visualize or feel what you wanted. Still, that thing happened for you. I am sure you can also think of counterexamples in which you stated your desires over and over again to the universe, and still nothing happened. I know from personal experience that as long as you state your intention to the universe, more about that in my book Band Manifestation Secrets, and then don't seek to contradict it with limiting beliefs or opposing thoughts, such as thoughts of fear, worry, doubt, the manifestations will occur for you in due course. Even worrying about when and whether a manifestation will occur is an opposing thought, which has the effect of cancelling out your good intentions. Space, just like time, is an illusion, where in fact everything is here and now. Notice how when we use the phrase here and now, here refers to space, while now refers to the time aspect. Also notice that when you did the earlier exercise of closing your eyes and holding the intention of love, the end result was not contingent on where you were. You could be in your favorite armchair at home, or you could just as well have been standing in line at the store. In fact, no matter where you hold the intention of love, the universe always responds unfailingly. Therefore, this is proof that physical location does not matter. If physical location truly mattered, then you could only get the universe to respond while you were at certain places and not others. The fact that you are able to access your feelings at every single point in physical space shows that universal laws go beyond physical boundaries. With this new understanding in mind, think of visualization not as an exercise to send out signals. Think of everything you need, including what you're trying to manifest, as already here and now. When you close your eyes and visualize whatever it is that you want, be it a physical object, experience, or a particular outcome, feel the feelings, as if that manifestation or demonstration has already taken place for you. There is no time lag, and there is no delay. Get yourself to feel the exact same feelings as you would when the physical manifestation occurs. 
So if you want a new car, feel the exact same feelings of exhilaration, as best as you can. There is no rule that says you need the physical object to experience the exact same feelings. You don't. You can feel those same feelings independently of whether the actual thing has manifested for you. When you get to this stage, you are effectively transcending the boundaries of physical time and space. You are becoming one with whatever you are wanting, and bridging that physical gap that exists between you and the desired item. Choose an object or experience which you would like to experience in your physical reality. For beginners, it is easier to choose a tangible object which you can focus your attention upon, since an experience may involve more layered feelings. Relax, close your eyes and then picture yourself in the scene. If you want a new red car, picture yourself driving the car and every single detail of the new red car. It may be helpful to go test drive the car, or to go online to search for photographs of the car to aid yourself in the construction of this mental picture. By now, you may be rolling your eyes and thinking, oh no, here he goes again about visualizations and making mental pictures or movies. It's the same old thing again. That's what I thought as well at the beginning. The first book I read and the first teachings I encountered spoke of visualizations and creating a mental picture. So did the last book I read and most of the other books in the middle. In the beginning I was skeptical. I was looking for something new. If you read most of the negative reviews people leave for books on manifestation and conscious creation, the number one complaint that pops up is, there was nothing new in this book. These people put the book down and go in search for something new that will help them. They are always looking for that one breakthrough technique that will finally work for them. But, here's the kicker, these techniques are not about what you do. They're dependent on who you are. They are dependent on your inner state. What do you believe about the techniques you are doing? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just visualizing because the book tells you it would be beneficial to do so, and because many others have done so and received good results? Or are you really immersing yourself in the process because you now know it is in line with universal laws and it will also work for you? Until you adopt the latter approach, all of these techniques will not work for you because the person inside has not changed. The observer has not changed, and therefore the quantum field cannot change. To affect the quantum field where there is no time and no space requires the observer to be different. This means setting and holding new intentions about the process. When you are able to change your inner observer, often referred to as the inner consciousness, your outer world changes for you spontaneously. So approach visualization not as some act of magnetic attraction although it does seem like so at the beginning. It is easy to see why misconceptions like this can develop. Suppose an individual does not have a red sports car, and so he visualizes daily. Along the way he also manages to release enough resistance and puts himself in the position to receive the red sports car in his life, and so finally he amasses enough money to buy it. One moment, along the space-time continuum, the red sports car was not there. The next moment, it materializes in his life. Therefore to a person who does not know the higher workings of spiritual laws, what he has asked for has suddenly appeared in his physical experience. One moment it was not there, and the next moment it somehow popped into his existence. A person who adopts this belief will then work harder and harder at trying to have the universe pick up on his requests. Whenever things do not work, he will assume that there is something wrong with the sending of signals, that they are not being received and interpreted correctly by the universe. This illusion is only perpetuated if you see yourself as a physical being standing in physical space, being separate from the universe, that is supposedly some entity that is up there or out there. Can you see why now, that when man views himself as physically separate from pure spirit, he has to spend so much time broadcasting his beliefs to some receiving station out there that will finally receive and act on them? But there is no receiving station. There is no broadcasting station. These are all very useful analogies teachers over the ages have used to explain these concepts to others, but you must recognize them for what they are, mere maps that represent reality, and not reality itself. Whatever analogies that are being used can be very helpful in explaining concepts, but after that the inner reality must be experienced himself, by the student. What really happens with you visualize? One day as I was visualizing and going through a mental picture exercise, I suddenly heard a very clear voice within me say, relax, 
not strain. At that moment everything clicked for me. I wasn't relaxing enough. I was trying so hard to visualize and to feel the feelings, as if the stronger I felt those feelings, the stronger they would be felt by the universe. I was putting in more effort and getting counterproductive results. The moment I heard those words, my mind and body instantly relaxed. I enjoyed the process instead of wanting the physical process to actually achieve something. And so it is the way with visualizations. Why do you even want to visualize in the first place? You visualize because it feels good. You visualize because it relaxes and calms you down greatly. You visualize for no other reason, other than because it feels good to you. Therefore, if it does not feel good to you, if it feels as if you are struggling to hold a mental picture and straining too hard, mentally repeat the words which came to me, relax, not strain. There is no strain or difficulty in any of these processes. You should be relaxing right into them and enjoying them immensely. And if at this point in your life, you find that you cannot, for whatever reason, enjoy these visualization sessions, stop doing them. Stop beating yourself up over them. Don't think that manifestations can only occur if and only if you visualize. They will occur regardless. Visualizations are not a necessary condition for manifestations to occur. An alignment with universal laws is a necessary condition. Here's a very powerful addition to your visualization exercises, if you choose to do them. Close your eyes, relax yourself mentally and picture whatever it is that you want. Immerse yourself fully in the experience. While you are doing so, tell yourself that space and time is an illusion. There is no space and time, there is only here and now. Everything is here and now. Immerse yourself in the here and now, the single-pointedness of it all. Repeat these words to yourself and more importantly feel the essence of what they mean, there is only here and now. Everything is here and now. This is very important. You must feel the true essence of what they mean. Just as in the previous chapter when I resisted the urge to look at the watch and told myself that time is merely an illusion, tell yourself that there is no space and no time. Immerse yourself in a space where your physical desires are already present, here and now. Remind yourself that any separation you perceive is only illusory. It is necessary for us to make sense of this world, and to enjoy this world. But more importantly, tell yourself that you are bypassing space and time, to enjoy right at this moment, whatever it is that you are wanting to have in your physical experience. Tell yourself that it does not matter if you do not have it, because you can already access those feelings right here and now, by closing your eyes and holding that clear mental picture or intention. Feel the feelings more than the words you are saying, because your feelings will signify true understanding of the principles we have discussed. When you really understand the principles behind my words, then no words are necessary. To sum it up, visualization is not a process where you attempt to broadcast signals. Instead, visualization is a process in which you use to bridge the time and space standing between where you currently are, and where your desires are. When you visualize, all space and time limitations disappear, and you experience the feelings associated with your manifestation right here and now. As you access these feelings on a regularly basis, you gradually start to create a new reality for yourself. It becomes easier for you to ease into that new manifested reality. When I first started visualizing, I was often unsure of whether I was doing it correctly. Still, I did it anyway, three times a day for no more than five minutes each time. I visualized one thing at a time using the techniques shared earlier, not attempting to broadcast any signals out to the universe or to attract anything, but simply just to allow myself to bridge the gaps of time and space. My visualization experiences became very enjoyable for me, and each time I opened my eyes, I would go about my normal daily routine without even thinking about what happened during the session. Barely a week after I started my thrice daily sessions, I receive an unexpected phone call from an old client of mine who had some work for me. Just like that, what I had asked for appeared in my life in the most harmonious circumstances possible. Because I had bridged the gaps of space and time, I had gradually eased myself into a new reality where what I asked for was already in existence. Had I worried about how it would come to me, or fretted over whether it would work, none of it would have happened. The universe always knows the best way to deliver something to you, so leave that part to the universe.
In my case, it came through an old client who had previous contact with me. Apparently, the universe saw that as the easiest way to fulfill my desires. What's even more exciting is that the channel in which the universe fulfills your desires will be different from how it fulfills mine, so keep an open mind and engage in the joyful attitude of play. Do these exercises because they feel good, then drop any thought of them completely and go about your daily lives. The universe rings when you least expect it. Chapter 7, How to Overcome Negative Conditioning That Block Your Manifestations What happens during your visualization and meditation sessions is important, but what do you do during the rest of your waking hours? What do you do with the rest of your time? More pointedly, how do you feel and what do you think when you're not actively turned inwards? Most people who adopt the misguided notion that visualization is a sending out or broadcasting of intentions wrongly believe that if they broadcast their intentions strongly enough three times a day, whatever they do in between, for the rest of the day does not matter. In fact, whatever you do during the remaining 15 hours matters just as much, or even more. Assuming that you sleep for 8 hours, visualize and meditate collectively for 1 hour a day, and then engage in your usual activities for the remaining 15 hours of the day. How you feel in those 15 hours is of crucial importance. If you can understand this principle, you'll achieve great progress in whatever you're doing. Here's a quick question, how do you feel during most of your day? Do you feel at peace and secure? Do you feel positively expectant? Do you feel a sense of lightness, deep trust in the universe and peaceful most of the time? If you do, then I surmise that things must be going very well for you, even though we have not met in person. Things must turn out well for you, for it is universal law. You don't even have to feel good all the time. That again, is another misconception. You just need to feel good most of the time, and soon you'll find all the good things starting to flow into your experience. Let me give you a personal example. Most people assume that since I write these spiritual books that I feel good absolutely 100% of the time. That can't be further from the truth. I am just like everyone else. I have my good days, and I have my bad days. Sometimes I observe and give my attention to unwanted things, which results in me feeling sad, angry, or depressed. Sometimes I experience physical situations with others, which again invoke negative feelings. How you handle these negative or unwanted feelings is a lesson in itself. Once again, Abraham Hicks have an analogy in which one would not deliberately paste a happy face sticker over their fuel gauge, so as not to see when their tank is running low. Or that one would not deaden the nerves on their fingers so as not to feel the burning sensation when touching a hot object. Obviously, our negative thoughts and feelings have value. Their greatest value is in teaching us that we are focused upon something bad or unwanted at the moment, and that our job is to turn away from it, to focus in the direction of where we ultimately want to go. Once again it is easy to see why individuals who believe in the notion of broadcasting signals to the universe will frown upon this concept of embracing our negative feelings, because they will want to be extra careful about what they are broadcasting to the universe at any given moment. Yet there is no broadcasting involved, the universe picks up on all of our intents perfectly and instantaneously. The bad feelings are letting you know that whatever the universe is picking up and giving you more of is not in line with what you want. That's why it feels bad to you. Being a conscious manifester is something that can be done by everyone. In the opening chapter of this book, I talked about how you already have all the apparatus you need to do everything in this book. However, sticking to the practice requires some determination and inner work, especially if we have been conditioned over long periods of time to think in a certain way by society. So don't give up if you can't seem to direct your thoughts in the desired manner at the beginning, for you will soon get better at it. And the better you get at all of this, the easier it is to excel at it because you are already coasting in the right direction. Let's say I'm working happily and suddenly some worrying thoughts come up for me. They could be worrying thoughts about anything, the actual subject does not matter. For most people who believe in the outdated notion that you are trying to attract something from the universe, it becomes a constant inner struggle because they are always trying to suppress such worrying thoughts. All their waking hours go along the lines of, oh no. I better stop feeling this way now before the universe takes back my new car. You get the idea. But this is not the way it works. 
You are not being rewarded each time you feel good and penalized each time you feel bad. The universe is not working on some kind of a scoring system. So don't be afraid if negative thoughts come into your awareness. Embrace them. They are like the fuel gauge in your car, letting you know that you have to take corrective action before something bigger happens, which is your car running out of fuel in the middle of the road. When you notice your car running low on fuel, what do you do? You don't start saying oh no, I must not feel this way. I must not believe that my car is running out of fuel. I must drive extremely slowly and carefully to avoid it running out of fuel in the middle of the road. That would be absurd and downright hilarious in our everyday lives. But that's exactly what most people are doing with their negative feelings. They say, oh no, I must not allow myself to feel bad. I must suppress all bad feelings right now and replace them with good thoughts. Then it becomes an ongoing struggle because one can never really suppress our bad feelings without facing them head on. They just keeping coming up over and over again for us until we do something about them. When you feel a negative thought, the most resourceful thing you can do in the moment, and the greatest help you can be to yourself, is to stop judging yourself for it. Let it be okay to feel the feeling in the moment. Let it be okay to have the thought in the moment. This very simple shift in perception will change your reality. Instead of beating yourself up over every negative thought, tell yourself that sometimes you have positive thoughts and sometimes you have negative thoughts, and it is alright to feel both of them. So take a deep breath and embrace the negative, worrying thought when it comes. Once again, it is very useful to let the negative feeling or thought express itself fully in your physical body. Most of us are afraid of these bad feelings. This is again linked to the misplaced belief that these bad feelings are sabotaging our intentions. But remember that there is a buffer of time before anything happens? The buffer of time allows you to make timely corrections before unwanted physical manifestations happen. Let's say you worry about your bills, and whether they will be paid. This feeling feels familiar to you, and in some kind of a perverse way, it even makes you feel good and safe. Remember what we discussed earlier about these feelings being familiar territory. They are something instantly recognizable by your body as a feeling of financial worry. Contrast this feeling with that of love which you felt earlier in this book, their signatures and blueprints are very different. The way they feel energetically is very different. Give thanks that you are able to tell the differences between the two. Now that you feel these feelings of financial worry fully in the body, it is good to identify them. How do they feel like to you? In which part of your body do you feel them? Once again, if you adopt the old misguided notion that this is sabotaging your manifestations, you will never want to engage in this exercise. But once you understand the true nature of the universe, and how there is value in experiences like this, you open up. You begin to see the feeling for what it is. Just a feeling, a negative thought. A worry is nothing but a negative feeling. That's all. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. Recognize the feeling for what it is just energy. Once you begin to map out where the negative feeling is in your body, for example, as a tight lump in your throat, or as a knot in your stomach, or even a slight throbbing at the back of your neck, or tightness in your shoulders, you are allowing yourself to feel the feelings fully. You have come face to face with the feeling, and are now seeing it, quite possibly for the first time, for what it really is, just a feeling in your body brought on by one thought which you had earlier. And now this is the key question to ask yourself, do you want to believe in this feeling? If you do, you'll go down the garden path like a lamb to slaughter. You'll be walking down the same old familiar path of thinking up all the negative scenarios and what ifs, everything will be same old, same old to you. Most people who do not understand the higher nature of things will choose this first path by default. Their current level operating in the world does not allow them to choose anything else. They do not see the value in choosing anything else. Therefore, they do not and continue to create by default. But you are different. You have been equipped with the tips and techniques in this book. You know the truths of the universe. You know you can choose differently. And therefore, you choose differently. You choose not to believe in the thought. You choose to believe in something completely different. Suppose you have a fear or worry over whether you'll be able to pay your bills this month. 
This is the initial thought that led to the fear or worry response, which is now identified as a sickening feeling in your stomach. This worrying feeling feels so familiar to you. But if you're able to catch yourself at this moment and remember what we have learned earlier, you know that you can set a different intention to which the universe responds instantly. Therefore, let's choose something different. Choose another thought that makes you feel better. At the beginning, this takes practice but you'll soon get the hang of this process. So let's see, what thoughts can possibly feel better in this case? Hmm, how about, even though I have worried about my finances in the past, I have always been able to pay them when due. Things have always worked out for me. This thought is just as true, and in fact, may be more true than the first negative worrying thought that came up for you. So now, after consciously choosing the second thought, you notice that the worrying or negative feelings are not as intense as before. You have indeed made a step in the positive direction. Then from there, you choose another related thought that brings you closer to where you want to feel. It may be this, hmm, that thought was probably a conditioned response from the past. In the past I would have worried, but I don't now. And so bit by bit, you consciously choose and replace negative, unwanted thoughts that produce unwanted feelings in your body with positive thoughts that feel better. I credit Abraham Hicks for this process because it is truly one of the few effective processes that I have found to get rid of those small, negative, resistant thoughts that may keep showing up for you. The key is to tackle these negative worry thoughts one at a time, as they arise instead of simply believing in them. If you will devote some time to do this consciously for most of your waking hours, you will find that gradually the worry thoughts subside because you have let go and released the pent-up energy that was associated with each of them. Your reality will start changing too. I can't tell you the number of people who overlook this crucial step of managing their feelings during the remaining 15 hours of their daily lives, while focusing all their effort on what happens during the 10 to 15 minutes they spend visualizing or stating their intentions. Compared with the amount of time you spend feeling what you usually feel during the day, that 10 to 15 minutes is very little. Therefore, if you want the 10 to 15 minutes of quiet, inward activity to make a difference, you must actively manage your feelings during the remaining 15 hours or so of your waking moments. Here are two common questions I receive from this. First, how does the simple process of recognizing a negative thought, and then replacing it with a slightly better one, and another slightly better one, until you feel good help in the manifestation process? It makes all the difference. If you do it consistently and train yourself to do it all day, every day, things will start happening like magic for you. You'll get to that magical state where doors start opening for you, and inspired manifestations start occurring for you without any physical action necessary. When you can let your worry thoughts go and feel good most of the time, you will be engaged in one long, continuous visualization session throughout the day. Your manifestation effectiveness will be increased many times, because you'll now be in a receptive state where miracles can happen for you. Reading about this magical state is definitely no substitute for you to experience it yourself. But I would like to give you a taste of what it feels like. First of all, if you are consistent in applying the process taught above, and if you deliberately feel better thoughts whenever negative ones arise, you'll soon find that the negative ones lose their emotional charge. Because you'll be vibrating at such higher energetic levels, those lower level thoughts of fear and worry have no way of reaching you. You'll not be able to attract those thoughts as easily into your thinking. They'll simply fade away and become a thing of the past. I hardly worry nowadays. It is just a natural state of being for me today to feel good all the time, to feel at ease all the time, and to feel a deep sense of inner peace and connection with the universe. Yet a few years ago I was a chronic worrier. I worried about everyone and everything. I worried about finances, about my future, about how I would be perceived by others. Most destructively, I believed in those worrisome thoughts. I allowed myself to go down that line of thinking, with similar unwanted results in my life. The results I observed then perpetuated more of the same thinking. That's why I say it takes some consistency and persistence in the beginning. After you break through that unseen barrier, when the majority of your thoughts are in the desired direction, then things get easier for you. Remember that the tipping point is when the majority, more than 50%, of your thoughts are in the direction that you want. That's the time you start moving in the desired direction. 
Most people who dismiss these techniques as too simplistic are always looking for big changes. They are always looking for that one simple step, or one big slash new thing which they can do that will put their request out to the universe forever, such that they don't ever have to worry about it again. But these are the same people who keep worrying about whether they are doing the right thing, or why their desires have not been manifested yet for most of their waking moments. Remember that the key is what you do and how you feel during the majority of your waking hours. Chapter 8, Living from Inspiration and Receiving Your Good I have mentioned in my other books that you do not need to have a very strong intention, but you do need to have clear intentions. If you stated your intention just once, and never worried about it ever again, things will still happen very quickly for you. The weight becomes optional, and the circumstances under which things come into your life can only be described as miraculous, or even magical. There is nothing impossible for the universe. As I recount in my book The Magic Feeling, the universe knows of no physical time or space limitations, and always knows the perfect way to deliver your desires to you. Therefore, what you do in those 10 to 15 minutes of visualization or meditation is the asking. And what you do in the remaining 15 hours of your waking life is the receiving. You can only receive what is in line with your highest desires if you are not clouded with contradictory, worrying thoughts. The way to feel good most of the time is to learn how to deal with negative thoughts and feelings as they occur. Recognize that you have the power, ability, and choice to substitute a negative thought for a better feeling one. Keep substituting one thought for another until you reach that awesome good feeling place. If you do so consistently, you put yourself in a state where manifestations occur very easily for you. The strangest thing, and strongest confirmation, about being in this state is that you don't even care whether your physical manifestations occur. You're just feeling good, going about your day, knowing that you are able to bridge the gaps of time and space and access the feelings associated with what you want at will. You feel an inexplicable amount of energy and inspiration. You look at everything and feel one with it. You accept everything and want to change nothing. Everything is perfect, just the way it is. You feel inspired to do certain things, go to certain places, or connect with certain people. Follow those impulses. Everything arises of its own accord, as if there is a universal force coordinating everything. And indeed there is. There is no strain involved. Remember the words I received while I was in meditation? Relax, not strain. There is no strain involved in all of life. How can we get to and live from this state of inspiration? First, know that you can get there if you are willing to give up your negative, worrying fear thoughts. Those thoughts seemed normal to you in the past, but now they no longer serve your highest good. So make a consistent effort to replace one negative, worrying thought as it arises with a better feeling one, and another one, until those negative thoughts no longer have any pull on you. Hold intentions of love or abundance as often as possible, and immerse yourself in the feelings of it for longer and longer periods each day. You can do this anywhere, while you're at work, working at the computer or standing in line at the store. As you play with this often, you bridge the gap and blur the lines between your current reality and where you want to be. As I close this book, take this once again as an invitation to play in the great universe of life. And hold these truths close to your heart for only you can prove them to yourself. Chapter 9, Rules for Playing in Time and Space The period of time between the setting of an intention and the manifestation of your desires exists for your benefit. This wait time is to allow you to clarify your intentions, and to focus your energies on creation instead of undoing your unwanted creations. This period of time is in direct proportion to the amount of resistant thoughts, negative worries, fear thoughts, doubts, that you hold. The more contradictory thoughts you have, the longer the waiting takes. The wait time separating you from your manifestations is strictly optional, depending on your beliefs about the creative process and what you are creating. Time is a perceptual illusion. We can slow it down, or speed it up at will. One of the fastest way to see through the illusion of time is to resist the urge to look at your watch unnecessarily, and to tell yourself the following, I am where time comes from. Time is an illusion and I can always stretch and make more of it. Try the above when you are running late. You'll be pleasantly surprised by what happens and your newfound sense of freedom when you are freed from the crutches of time. Just like time, space is an illusion. 
There is no out there. Everything is here and now. When you meditate, quiet yourself and drop yourself into the here and now. Remind yourself that there is only here and now, and that there is no time and no space. When you visualize, you are bridging the time and space separating you from the manifested reality. You bridge this gap by accessing the exact same feelings associated with your manifestation, and bringing those feelings into the here and now. What you do slash think slash feel for the majority of your waking hours is just as important as what you do during your moments of visualization or intention setting. One of the most effective ways to let go of a lifetime of negative conditioning is to deal with each negative thought as it arises. Substitute one thought for a better feeling, more positive one, until the old, worrisome thoughts no longer hold any emotional charge over you. This process above will be difficult at first, because you are using your creative mental faculties in an entirely new way. You'll also have many negative thoughts to deal with. However, if you stick with the process for a few weeks, the amount of worrying slash contradictory thoughts you have to deal with will be significantly reduced. Soon, they'll be a thing of the past and in their place, will be a deep feeling of profound peace.